this program is for discussion purpose only. Business Plus TV or any of our anchor does not bear any responsibility or liability towards the content. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaikum, Nazin. Aap aur karubar ke ek special episode ke saath, aaj ham Expo Karachi se aapki khidmat mein hazir hain. अगर हम पाकिस्तान में कुछ ऐसी इंडस्ट्रीज़ के बारे में बात करें कुछ ऐसे सेक्टर्स के हवाले से बात करें जिनको बाइन लार्ज हाईलाइट नहीं किया जाता लेकिन उनके कंट्रीब्यूशन के हवाले से देखें और उसमें सरमाकारी के हवाले से देखें तो बहुत ज़्यादा एक तो पोटेंशियल है और दूसरा हम देख रहे हैं कि बाहर चाहे किसी भी मुल्क के हवाले से हम बात करें बाहर से काफ़ी लोग यहाँ आते हैं और वह यहाँ पर एक तो अपनी प्रोडक्ट्स इम्पोर्ट करना चाहते हैं दूसरा यहाँ पर जो हमारे एक्सपर्ट्स हैं उनकी सर्विसज़ को हासिल करना चाहते हैं पाकिस्तान में जब हम वेंटिलेशन के बारे में बात करते हैं हीटिंग के बारे में बात करते हैं रेफ्रिजरेशन के बारे में बात करते हैं तो एक आम तसर तो यह है कि ये कोई इतनी बड़ी इंडस्ट्री नहीं होगी लेकिन जब हम बात करें तो पाकिस्तान में सिर्फ हम इन्हीं तीन चार चीज़ों के हवाले से बात करें तो तकरीबन अगर एक अंदाजे के मुताबिक देखें तो एच जो एक सोसाइटी है उसमें तकरीबन दो से ज़्यादा मेम्बर्स हैं बहुत ज़्यादा इम्पोर्ट भी होती है ये जो मशीनरी है जिसके ज़रिए बिल्डिंग्स में मैन्युफैक्चरिंग जो प्लांट्स हैं वहाँ पे हीटिंग कूलिंग की फैसिलिटी दी जाती है होटल्स की बात कर लें हम हॉस्पिटल्स की बात कर लें आ, लेकिन इसको इतना ज़्यादा हाईलाइट अभी तक नहीं किया गया आज हम एक्सपो सेंटर कराची में आए और यहाँ पर हमने काफ़ी फॉरनर्स से मुलाकात की उनसे जब हमने बात की तो उन्होंने कहा कि पाकिस्तान में हम एक तो अपनी प्रोडक्ट्स को इम्पोर्ट करना चाहते हैं दूसरा यहाँ पे जो पोटेंशियल है उसको हम देखना चाहते हैं और ये जानना चाहते हैं कि यहाँ की इंडस्ट्री मज़ीद क्या ऐसी प्रोडक्ट्स हैं जो मैन्युफैक्चरिंग के हवाले से भी और इंपोर्ट के हवाले से भी हमारे लिए भी काफ़ी सूदमंद हो उनसे ये भी हम बात करेंगे कि पाकिस्तान में सरमाकारी के हवाले से इस सेक्टर में कितना ज़्यादा उनको एक तो पोटेंशल नज़र आती है और दूसरा कितना ज़्यादा काम हो सकता है इसी वाले से आज हमें ज्वाइन किया है डेविड अंडरवुड इज़ द प्रेसिडेंट ऑफ आशे डेविड वेलकम टू द शो थैंक यू यू मोस्ट वेलकम एंड विद हिम वी हैव जेम्स वैलर वाइस प्रेसिडेंट एशरे जेम्स वेलकम टू द शो थैंक यू वेरी मच यू वेलकम डेविड वील स्टार्ट विद विद द थिंग दैट इफ यू लुक एट पाकिस्तान एंड इफ यू लुक एट द इंडस्ट्री ऑफ पाकिस्तान हाउ मच पोटेंशियल डू यू सी इन ventilation refrigeration heating sector when we talk about high rise buildings we talk about hospitals we talk about manufacturing plants of course control environment is required i would say in pakistan one of the major things is your cold chain development you have a lot of product to sell to the world you have a lot of product to distribute amongst your, your population and refrigeration is a very important aspect of doing all that but you're also a developing economy You've got a lot of large high-rise buildings. You've got a lot of office towers. You've got all kinds of buildings that are going on, and we hope that with the association with Ashray, we can help transfer that knowledge that we have within Ashray to assist you in the, in this development. Benson, David, uh, when we talk about economy of Pakistan, if you look at the volume of the economy of Pakistan, it is a 257 billion American dollar economy. uh there's a possibility that in next 30 to 40 years we would be perhaps in the top 20 economies of the world when we talk about the population it's 200 million large one of the largest population uh having country in the world sixth most populous country in the world uh is this something which attracts the foreigners as as you've been over here also and, and, and as with the collaboration is concerned how does ashray see this uh, particular opportunity it is a development that is related to population because population demands particularly cooling systems in a in a climate like pakistan generally speaking certainly in the southern part of pakistan that for good productivity you need good in indoor environments and indoor environments are the things that we are able to assist you from a design point of view as jim has been saying those standards we develop and how we share our knowledge our education programs that we have available that are available worldwide that distribute that effective information that is in our standards so we are attempting to assist everybody in the world with what we have developed as technology but this technology is not only developed by north americans we have people from pakistan who serve on our standards committees serve on our technical committees so they're bringing your ideas to north america so we are sharing our knowledge across the world it's not just giving knowledge it's sharing our knowledge 
uh, knowledge can be shared with with training programs also through conferences also so how how frequently the conferences are organized uh, in in various parts of the world so that all these people gather and they learn from each other i would suggest conferences across the world are organized very frequently in my years president i will probably go to about 12 of them over that 12 month period i'll be going to one a month Great. so there are lots of them in lots of parts of the world and you say james about the same uh, I think the other thing that there's also, besides just the conferences, there's a lot of information available uh, on the websites of organizations like ASHRAE and others that um, you can get virtual conferences, playbacks, uh, papers, and white papers uh, to help educate and share that knowledge. Yes. Uh, and so in addition to this, uh, when we talk about a few sectors, such as pharma sector or some other sectors also, where controlled uh, temperature or environment is something which is extremely essential for the productivity, for the quality of the products also. So in Pakistan, when we talk about the pharma sector, there are around 600 companies and uh, the, the size of the pharma sector is around 2.3 billion American dollars. We do export also around 190 million American dollars. Pharma products are being exported from Pakistan. Uh, how much opportunity do you think is for, for the businessmen who are from this sector for the ventilation, refrigeration, heating in this sector? I, I think the opportunities are huge. I mean, when you look at the pharma and any manufacturing, if you can improve the, the temperature quality, the consistency, um, you can increase production, you can increase quality, and with that you can increase the amount that you export and the amount that's available for the people within the country itself. So when you really you know, tighten up and improve that built environment, it allows for you to you know, really put out a greater product and a greater speed. And, then, and when we talk about the productivity of the employees, uh, nowadays what we have observed is that high-rise buildings are quite common in every part of the world. And when we talk about Pakistan, this trend is catching up. So uh, when we talk about Karachi or Lahore, Islamabad, where we may see high-rise buildings upcoming, so many projects are in the pipeline. So, in that regard, uh, the productivity of employees is also related to heating and cooling systems? I would say that, but I'm going to put that question a little bit differently. Mm -hmm. The cost of building a building, putting in its HVAC in our systems, relative to the cost for the people who are housed in that building, we are building buildings to house people, mm -hmm. house processes. Mm -hmm. We are not building buildings to make a monument. Mm -hmm. we are, and if you look at, at, at the cost, per individual that's in that building on a square footage or square meter basis on an annual basis, if you can increase that product productivity one or two percent, which is not difficult to measure, that will pay for a lot of increased better operation of those buildings to reduce energy consumption and to actually improve the indoor environment. That means that at the time of uh, the architecture of the building, it's essential that uh, the people from your industry should be having a kind of collaboration with the architect so that it may be designed in such a way that the energy consumption should reduce. It has to be an integrated approach. Um, the balance between the architecture and engineering uh, needs to be planned and deliberate. Um, it, it needs to not just be a, you know, two individual groups working separately. It needs to be an integrated process where we find ways to help the building perform better, um, how much windows are being installed, what type of insulation is being used, so that the mechanical systems can work properly. Uh, another key thing we look at is there's a lot of existing buildings. It's not just new construction that can be worked on. Um, how do you convert an existing building that maybe didn't have uh, adequate air conditioning to have more air conditioning to improve the comfort? How do you take a space and change it from uh, just office to maybe one that has a lot more data or a lot of other loads in it to provide the cooling for those equipment? So it has to be a combination of new construction, existing buildings, architecture and engineering, and it needs to be collaborative. So having proper cooling and heating system in the existing buildings, where at the time of construction or before actually construction started, uh, there was no collaboration. So would it be a kind of somewhat expensive thing, or it will be all the same? Uh, I think with creativity and really understanding the building, there are some ways to do it very cost effectively. Um, sometimes you have to make compromises as to how quality you can achieve because of the existing building, you, know, you can't just tear the building down and start over again. But in many ways, you can find solutions that can give you the comfort that you need and still maintain the cost structure. Because the whole thing is it needs to be affordable. And so David, has it 
uh, ever happened in any part of the world that uh, there were a few buildings which were constructed at the time of construction or before the construction. There was no collaboration, but once it was constructed, it was realized that it, uh, proper heating and cooling system may be uh, given the priority there, and for that, the cost was almost the same, which actually could have been uh, if the collaboration had been done before the construction of the building. That's a difficult question to answer. However, I would put it this way, mm -hmm. that in terms of cost of construction for existing buildings, we have to look at something. We currently have probably, in, in, in the Western world, 95% of the buildings already exist. That is the building stock that we have to address dramatically. When you look more in the developing economies, you generally are building new buildings. So you have an opportunity to build them well to start with, so you don't have to worry about the expense of reconstruction later, you know, 20 or 30 years after that building has been utilized, to actually uh, have to upgrade and, and redate those systems that will cost you a lot. So do it right the first time, not the second, third, and fourth time, because often that's more expensive. Mm -hmm. So, so in addition to the commercial use, if we talk about the domestic use, uh, if it is uh, very hot at home, then the wife might start beating the husband. So, so, <laughs> so, so for, the, for the domestic use, uh, like, uh, is it also common in other parts of the world that, uh, of course it is, as Europe is concerned, we have seen that uh, proper heating and cooling systems are installed in the, in the uh, houses also. Uh, uh, how much potential, again, you see this in, in Pakistan, and would it be a kind of expensive commodity? I don't really think it's going expensive. I mean, you just have to really change the style of life, you know, how you live in the building, where do you need cooling? Um, and it's probably more important, where do you need refrigeration to maintain the proper, um, you know, storage and use of, of pieces of equipment. But I think the residential market is the next thing, because once we experience the quality that we have um, in a modern office building, we're going to want to have it at our home, too. And, and we see that in, in the U.S. there are some advances in residential technology that people are saying, I can control my home from my phone. When I go to my office, I can't control anything. So we're seeing this crossover between the home and, and your workplace, trading technology back and forth, and the, the culture demands that each has the best available for you. Uh, David, when I talk to lots of businessmen in Pakistan, they do tell me that uh, there are a few, few things which are supposed to be done in Pakistan for the prosperity. As far as Pakistan's economy is concerned, this is agro-based economy, so we by and large depend on the agriculture, though our uh, engineering sector, our manufacturing sector is somewhat stronger, but again, the, the, the dependence is actually on the, the agriculture. And what we see is that there are so many places in Pakistan where uh, when we talk about fruit or when we talk about something, the perishable items, from farm to the market, it takes a lot of time. And uh, by the time that the product reaches to the market, almost 30, 40 percent waste is there. So how could this be overcome? And if suppose storage facilities are installed near the farmhouses, near the farms or the vehicles, which may be uh, used to take the product from the farm to the market, again, would it be uh, somewhat expensive, or would it be somewhat very beneficial for the people who are in this business? Well, I would suggest that in terms of the initial cost of equipment, it would be expensive. However, when you're having a 40% wastage, you look at how much product they have to produce in order to make the same amount of money if they'd all got to market without spoilage. And I would suggest that that second phase is probably by far the most, most important so let's looking at a life cycle of costing as opposed to just the cost of the independent product. So I would strongly recommend that you look carefully at improving that cold chain so that that product is not wasted for, for more than one reason. The second reason is it's getting uh, food productivity to the people who need it, the people who want food to eat. That's right. Um, James, uh, when we uh, discuss something such as import of uh, the commodities which we import from different parts of the world. Pakistan's trade deficit is on average around 18 to 20 billion American dollars uh, every year. And that is because we import a lot of things. And when we talk about ventilation, refrigeration, anything which can be used to control environment, uh, a rough estimate is that around four to five billion American dollars are spent on import. Uh, do you see any opportunity in Pakistan in terms of investment from the people who are from, from other part of the world, they may come and invest over here uh, where the, 
the educated uh, youth is available, where the, the educated uh, workforce is available, the technical experts are also available? Well, I, I think the opportunities for investment are great, as we just talked a little bit about with, say, the refrigeration, sort of preventing spoilage. Um, the key is that upfront first cost to maybe convert a facility to have refrigerated trucks and some refrigeration process at the site of harvest so they can make it to transport. That investment opportunity is there. The, the challenge is just trying to get those two parties to meet and provide that return. Because if you prevent the spoilage, you can recover that investment rather quickly, but you just need to get the two parties to be together. So that's sometimes something where you know, maybe the government can assist and, and formulate those opportunities for the investment to occur. But where there's, where there's waste and spoilage of that magnitude, there's definitely opportunities for investment. David, what would you suggest about it? I always say you need to go to the basics, and the basics is education. You educate your, popu educate your population, you have good engineers that actually can look at those things that will reduce that, that spoilage by designing proper and good systems that you will effectively improve the marketplace enormously. Design systems, like how important are the, the systems which are designed and uh, how effectively they can be used for the business uh, to earn money by selling the products also? Well, that comes to an important question. Do you select equipment or do you design a system? A system is different than just selecting equipment. It's looking at the, the totality of what you're doing. Does this product work with that product, with that product in the most efficient manner? So that's a system approach. And Asher uses a system approach in most of our design standards. And we feel that's the way that you need to go to appropriately reduce energy consumption in the world and improve productivity. Right. Uh, as an energy is concerned, um, like there's a lot of talk about the depletion of the resources. So uh, how effectively the solar system, solar energy can be used for the same? I think there's a lot of debate about, you know, how many natural resources we have, what's left, what's remaining. And I think we need to look beyond that question and say, we are using a natural resource. Anything we can do to provide free energy, be it from sun, wind, um, you know, thermal, other sources, we need to use that to the best of our ability. We need to use our engineering skills to bring that solar power so that we're not using any resources at all. And, and the challenge is we need to make sure we have the right systems. If you're using, say, a solar-powered system, it only works when the sun is out. So you need to make sure you design that system so that the occupants can still function on a cloudy day or when it starts to rain. So when we look at these systems, it does increase some of the design complexity that we have to deal with and the systems that you have to do in, install. So the key is when we look at adding these systems, they must be designed properly, but then operations. And when we learn how to operate the systems, that's where you really get the energy savings is in the operations. And, and, and if I talk about the contribution of ASHRAE in this regard, what has ASHRAE been doing? Uh, as in terms of suggestions, in terms of advice, in terms of uh, uh, the vision? Well, I think one of the big things that ASHRA provides is there are some standards and documents on how to measure what the energy consumption is and how the energy savings is calculated. Uh, because really we have to score every project and understand how it's performing. So there are standards that can measure what is the energy before and the energy after. You compare it, you normalize it with the weather data to show what the actual savings is, not just was it a cooler summer, therefore I used less energy. So when we look at these things, we can really quantify, and that allows people to make business decisions based on that energy savings to provide things in the future. There's also a lot of guidance on the operations side, because the best design, if it's designed and installed, it needs to be operated. So we always need to make sure that we provide that training and the standardization on how to operate the systems how to recalibrate the systems to make sure they stay at a high standard. Just like you bring your car in for a tune-up, you need to take your building and maintain it over time as well. And then, well, as in our program, we have to take a break. Welcome back, Nazin. अक्सर ये कहा जाता है कि इंटेलिजेंट या स्मार्ट बिल्डिंग्स आपकी ज़िंदगी को चेंज कर सकते हैं और जब हम बात करते हैं उन एक्सपर्ट्स की उन इंजीनियर्स की उन कंसल्टेंट्स की जो इस हवाले से हेल्प कर सकते हैं और ख़ास तौर पर जो हाउसिंग प्रोजेक्ट्स वगैरह हैं हमारे मुल्क में हम देख रहे हैं कि आज बहुत ज़्यादा काम हो रहा है हाउसिंग प्रोजेक्ट्स के हवाले से इंटेलिजेंट बिल्डिंग्स 
یا اسمارٹ بلڈنگس کیا واقعی ہماری زندگی کو تبدیل کر سکتے ہیں جیمس یو پرزنٹیشن واز اباؤٹ انٹیلیجنٹ اور اسمارٹ بلڈنگس how 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 would you describe it is it that if your wife is intelligent you would be intelligent <laughs> person and create a kind of intelligent community well i i think the key is um if you can make a smart building then you have to do less <laughs> and, and i think our goal in life is always to to get more for doing less so one of the things we look for is with the smart buildings is it allows us to focus on other aspects of our job and our our, our life and let the building adapt and, and do its own things and What's really driving it, you speak about the, the wife, is um, the ability in your home, for example, um, I can change the thermostat in my house. And my wife always says, you're changing the temperature up or down, <laughs> um, or I can open my garage door. And that, that control that we have with some of our smart technologies with our smartphones, we're wanting that in our buildings as well. Uh, and it's a great opportunity to really save some money as well as give people the power to feel that they're in control of their own environment as well as save energy. And same. Uh, David, um, uh, when we look at Pakistan's energy consumption, what we see is that around 50% of the total energy is consumed by the residential projects, the people like domestic consumption. Our industry consumes hardly 20 to 25% or maximum 30% of the total energy in Pakistan. So how could we bring about efficiency and efficiency through the projects? Well, I go back to Jim's talk on intelligent buildings. If you can build intelligence into your buildings, into your housing, that intelligence actually works upon itself so that you have a, a smart building, which is kind of a, you know, a, a, a mixture of terms. Whoever thought of a building itself being smart, it's usually just a piece of something here. But with internally, these systems actually build upon their information that they gather over time So you become a smart building. It's just like a, a great robot. A, a robot over time, when you're on the manufacturing procedures, actually gave, gains intelligence so they can work faster. I understand. And here comes the maintenance. Uh, computerized maintenance management. Does it really play a very big role in this? Maintenance, in my mind, that's where I was all my working career. And that's... Uh, long before dig digitization. And if you don't do proper maintenance, and if you don't have operators trained to do that maintenance, you will have a difficult time having your building run efficiently. And I go back to the actual start of the building. You know, there's what we call commissioning of a building and building systems. It's a very complicated definition within ASHRAE, but I've got a very simple definition, because I've been doing this since 1975, long before it was known by ASHRAE. And my, my view of what commissioning is, is transferring the designer's knowledge into the operator's hands. And if you can do that, you've solved 90% of your problem. Right, and, and, and if we talk about the designs, so is it possible to have beautiful designs with efficiency? Yes, as long as you don't miss that one piece in the middle. It's called the construction, the construction process. And one of the worst terms that I know of in our industry is called value engineering. That to me is a conundrum in terms. It just is never works well. It just says, can we make it cheaper? But if you look at a building, 90, there's a study done by the uh, US uh, government agency on all their buildings, and they found that 95% of the cost of their building was in actually owning the building, financing the building, operating the building, running the building, and housing people. Only 5% of the cost of a building is in its, in its new construction. So don't make the mistake of cheapening a building at the front end that will balloon the cost over that 95%. Right. We, we heard one of the presentations in which a presenter talked about rooftop gardens, how effectively the same system can be maintained uh, in the country like that of Pakistan or in the, in the world. I think the rooftop garden has some great benefits from a just quality of life. Um, you can do some wonderful things with providing a green space, a place for people to get away and be quiet um, and enjoy you know, kind of the life. Um, you can also combine it by when you have air conditioning equipment that pulls moisture out of the air, you can actually water your green roof by using your HVAC equipment's wastewater to power that. But I, I just think it's a wonderful opportunity to save energy as well as give a place for people to go to relax. It's, it's just a breath of fresh air. Right. In your presentation, I observed one thing that was that you talked about the warehousing lighting. Uh, 
uh, in Pakistan now this concept is actually getting getting a uh, lot of uh, prominence. Warehousing lighting uh, is something which can help the people reduce the cost of doing business. What would you say about it? Well, well I think lighting, I mean, there's many different ways you can, you can do some things with natural light, you know, skylights, things of that nature. Uh, to reduce the amount of light. There's um, things where you can put out occupant controls for the lighting. Uh, that's the best way to save because lights consume so much energy and if you can turn them off or reduce them, you can really save a lot of energy. And we have the best, most intelligent buildings and we try to you know, shave one or two percent here and there. But if you turn something off, you're saving a hundred percent. So the lighting controls is really what we're looking at trying to do is find ways to turn it off. If you don't need it, turn it off. I mean, how many times do you walk into a room and there's the window there and it's bright light shining in and you, and you can barely even see that the light's on. So we really got to drive that controls into that lighting so that we quit wasting energy because that's pure waste. And Sen, uh, nowadays what I've seen even in, in, in Pakistan that there are lots of buildings with a lot of glass work. So uh, there's a concept of high performance glass. What actually it is and how effectively it helps in terms of again cost of doing business and, and, and the, the beauty of the building also? Well, high quantities of glass have a couple of purposes. One of the ones that really is important is daylighting into the building. But you can cut down on the cost of what it is in terms of, of, of uh, energy going into that building if you shade the building properly. It's how do you get that light, light in, as far as possible into the building so it's effective and you can reduce the use of, of, of electrical energy to, to do uh, you know, uh, elimination with, with, with lights, of, like up here. So is it actually possible to have around 51% saving of the energy if there is high performing glass work in any building? Well, high performing glass, is, it has great variances. There's many, many different types of glass, but if you get into, you know, into in, Things like argon between, uh, you know, a double glazing uh, fenestration, it, it is much more improved than if you only have an air gap or if you have a single glazing, which buildings, you know, 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago were built with single glazing, just one sheet of glass, which is very energy inefficient. It's getting better and better and there are, you know, uh, glazing systems that are looked at continuously to try and improve their performance to make them more like a solid wall. But I'd like to go back to something else. That if you go back in history in this area of the world, and I experienced this about two and a half years ago when I was in India for a couple of weeks, you go into buildings, it'll be 95 degrees outside, and you walk into this mass building, which is you know very massive walls. It's sited properly, so it's getting natural ventilation and your temperature will drop by 15 or 20 degrees. It's very comfortable inside. You knew how to build a long, long time ago. We can take that, that technology and use it in our, in our world. And mass, you know, mass walls are very important in terms of actually reducing that, that, energy, that energy as it goes into the building itself. You can't do that in high rise, but you can do that in residential. You can do that in, 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 in mid rise buildings. And we can design better architecturally to reduce the amount of energy you know, required, required to run a building to make it comfortable. And since we've been talking about renewable energy also and, and uh, during the presentations also I heard one of the speakers giving presentation about a renewable energy and uh, he talked about the solar exposure analysis. Uh, like uh, if we talk about Pakistan here we have got harsh weather when it is winter it's extreme winter by and large and if it is uh, summer it is extreme summer so it's too hot during summer it's too cold during winter uh, and particularly in the northern part of our country it's too cold during winter and again too hot during the summers also so this solar exposure analysis how does this come into effect in terms of efficacy well, well I think not just the solar exposure but just what's the orientation of the building if you take a building and you model it through using some of the advanced engineering you can rotate that building and say, what would this building do if this was facing north? Now, if that same face was facing south. So it depends on where the sun is hitting it at what times of year. You can really change how that building performs. So you can see where the sun's coming in. Where do I need to place that window so that in the winter time it lets the heat in and in the summer it bounces the heat out through the glass. So there's a lot of things you can do with the solar analysis and the orientation analysis 
to capture the light when you want it, reflect the heat when you don't want it. And we find in many cases that by orientating a building properly, by just rotating it, sometimes you can change its energy consumption 20%. And imagine getting 20% savings for doing nothing but changing the orientation of your building. And I think through the modeling, you can really get some of these what-if scenarios planned out and see what the smart choice is before you build it. So James, that would work only in the high-risk buildings, or it can be also in the housing projects where there is just one or two-story it, it, it probably applies even better in the housing market because you're going to do that one design and repeat it multiple times. So you can spend the, the time and effort to do the model, rotate the model, analyze it, optimize it, and then repeat it. So it really applies for any construction that you're doing. Because as you talk about you know, the cost to modify an existing building, you can't rotate a building after it's built. So you got to get that orientation done correctly the first time. Right, and, and, and if we talk about the construction of the warehouses, like in Pakistan, what we see is that textile sector is the, the major sector in Pakistan when we talk about the exports. Our total exports are around 24 to 25 billion American dollars, and textile contribution is around 14 to 15 billion American dollars. What we have seen is that textile sector is moving towards sustainability. So how could sustainability be brought about in the textile sector, your views? Sustainability is an important aspect of all buildings, not just the textile industry. And what sustainability means, in my opinion, is that it's going to be able to continue, it's not going to be able to, it's not going to take, consume resources that can actually be beneficial to my grandchildren and your grandchildren. We want to make sure that we continuously have those things available to us as a society Sustainability is a societal issue. It's not just a building issue. It's a societal issue. And I think as, as, as uh, responsible design engineers and professionals, it is our responsibility to make sure these things are looked at. Design engineers, uh, do you think that um, all over the world we need to have exclusive universities for the design engineers who could really help the entire world in the days to come? Absolutely. And I, I, may I tell you a story? I'm a Canadian engineer. And in Canada, when we graduate from engineering, we all get this ring. Mm -hmm. And that ring, the, re the significance of that ring, it's only in my country where this happens for every engineer who graduates. It doesn't matter what, what discipline. Great, great, great. What the significance of it is that there was a bridge that was being built across the St. Lawrence River in Quebec City in 1907. Mm -hmm. It failed twice and killed 84 people. And in that, they found out there were engin engineering mistakes, construction techniques were not looked after properly, there was all kinds of engineering responsibility that could have saved those lives. Agreed. And, and then after that, there's a University of Toronto professor with uh, some other people that put together and said, we have to have a unique idea that reminds engineers to be professional. And then we uh, brought in a poet that you would recognize in this country, Rudyard Kipling. And he wrote a poem called The Ritual of the Calling of an Engineer. And that poem we recite when we actually go in to get this ring, and the only people in that room are other engineers. So it's very significant when a father gives it to a son or a daughter or vice versa. That is a very, very emotional thing. And it is where we really re respond to this poem saying that we will uh, use our engineering knowledge in a responsible way to protect society. Agreed, agreed. You are very much right. Engineers need to have the sense of ethics and of course the responsibility. James, you say about it. Well, I think the biggest thing is you need to be correct. Um, That's right. Just like you know, a doctor is responsible for the patient during a surgery, um, we're designing the space that people spend you know, eight, 10 hours a day in working. You know, that's the majority of their life. It needs to be healthy for them. It needs to protect that occupant and make sure that they're safe. So the engineer has a responsibility not to design the cheapest, but to design the best available for the individual. Uh, uh, since you talked about the occupancy, during your presentation, you talked about the design of the building and the occupants also. The role of occupants plays a major role. Uh, their role is more important in terms of energy saving and the things like that. It's become a huge opportunity for us. I mean, it used to be that the controls were, were maybe uh, pneumatic or systems that were hidden away in a closet. And now we're seeing controls being put into the occupied space where the occupant can actually control their own amount of air they're receiving, control the lighting. Um, and if you have the occupants, imagine the feedback you can get. 
If you have 100 people on a floor, that's 100 sensors that can talk and say what they're feeling, what they'd like, what they can do different. So I mean, the occupant is really what can drive that last percentage of savings in the world. Agreed. Uh, David, um, since you talked about the engineers, again, do the engineers look at, uh, while they, they go for the designs, they look at the weather. If we talk about Pakistan, here we have, uh, during summers, the day is for 15 hours and uh, um, the nights are very, very short. So when the buildings are designed or when the ventilation or the air conditioning or the heating system is to be implemented, of course, this thing must be taken care of. If you look at our standard 90.1, that is our energy standard, it has a series of climate zones that you use in, uh, for design work. And for instance, in a hot, humid climate, we have now a, stand, you know, a, design, zone, a design zone zero or uh, one or two, and depending on whether it's hot and humid or hot and dry, to the climate zone seven, which covers my country, where it's very cold like it is in the north of uh, Pakistan. And same, and same. So I mean, that, that's, it, it is a, it's an iteration of designs across a spectrum of, of different climate areas. So we, we, we're well aware of this, and we have taken responsibility to make sure that it's looked at carefully. Uh, in Pakistan, we did somewhat survey, and we did ask a few questions to the people in, in the residential projects, that why is it so that they, by and large, try to have the split air conditioners? Why not the chillers? Uh, the answer was that chillers are more expensive. So uh, the, the cost, is there any way to bring the cost down so that uh, there can be mass use of the chillers, not only in the in the manufacturing units or in the commercial use for the domestic use. Well, well, there's, there's two sides to that cost. There's one is the, the cost of the unit. Um, I, I just moved and I went from an older home to a newer home. Um, and my newer home is the exact same size of my old home, but the unit is 25% smaller because it has newer construction, it's a more efficient home, the envelope is more efficient, the glazing is more efficient. So when you look at the cost to do air conditioning of a, a house, you need to look at how much do I need to install? Is it one ton, two ton, three tons? And if you can reduce the size of that, that can reduce your cost significantly. Also, as you start to do more of it, it becomes cheaper to install. The manufacturers produce more, the installers get more familiar with it, and it can reduce the cost. So it, it needs to be a combination of maybe sprucing up your home to be a little more energy efficient so it doesn't need as much cooling and then installing the right cooling system. There's so many organizations where what we have seen is that when they have the buildings, they do look at a few things such as lighting as you talked about lighting during your presentation that uh, if there's poor lighting, it leaves a very negative impact on the productivity of the employees. And if it is uh, excellent lighting, the people become more, more productive. And same is the case with the ventilation, same is the case with the heating and uh, the refrigeration. Exactly. The cooling systems. And we, we used to talk about it being called indoor air quality, but it's really the indoor environment quality. So it's not only the temperature, but is the air moving. Um, you know, the, the joke is if I'm sitting there working, I, I don't want to, you know, listen and smell the person's curry next door the entire day, move that smell out of there so that I have, you know, fresh air, the right temperature, with the right lighting, um, without odors, and I can become more productive. So it has to be all of the above. David, you'll say about the same. Well, this is looking at future, we're talking a bit, a bit about that. Uh, we talk about sustainability, sustain, sustainability. One of the things that we don't do, that we could do, I think, efficiently in the residential market, if we start looking at a housing complex, not just the individual house, and if you've got a large enough area, you can put in central plant with, you know, with, with water systems that circulate and you take off from the water systems for each house individually. Mm -hmm. And you actually have those chillers that run throughout the course of the day and night. And you buy very efficient chillers and when there's very low occupancy, they don't have to operate at all. But when it starts to ramp up, you get much more efficient operation than you do with an individual unit per house. So that is a way to look at things in the future for sustainability. It's not been done. I don't know if possibly there are some areas, but I'm not aware of any where it Definitely has, not that, common. Well, that is something that would be, and again, I'll give you an example. And this is to do with buildings. In my own home of Toronto, hmm. they have what's called a deep lake water cooling project. And they needed more potable water for the city. 
So they, we have Lake Ontario, south of, south of our city. The bottom of Lake Ontario is at three degrees C. It never gets warmer. So they put pipes out on the lake, brought the water into the city, put it through heat exchangers, and developed a 10 kilometer loop around downtown Toronto and took 10 megawatts of, of electricity off the grid by using that central system. That's great. It was really wonderful having you, David, on the show. Same times. Thank you so much. It was really nice talking to you both. Well, Nazi, up to Khalil Tahi, up to Mezban Khalil Ahmed, our production team. Ijazat DJM, Allah Fez.